Hey everybody, welcome to the Multipliers Leadership Podcast. My name is Joseph and we are joined with our host and founder, Josh Foliart. And we are privileged to be able to have a special guest today. He His is name is Nathan master. Allen. Now, Nathan <laughs> is a husband. He's a father. He's a grill master, even a beekeeper, if that's your thing. Um, he is full of rich history, director of a global mission or global outfitters, as well as a missions pastor locally. He is he is like that of a pocket knife. He, he literally you open him up and there's more and more to reveal as you go along the way. Man, so, you Nathan, are so much fun. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, I- I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. The multi layers of Nathan Um, Allen, one of the greatest conversationalists uh, I've ever met. So, thanks for being on the podcast with us today, man. Setting the bar high. Yeah. Thanks. (laughs) I I I love so many things. It's just hard not to talk about things. So. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe we should. We'll save another one for talking about uh, grilling and beekeeping, probably, but. Uh, sure. But I've got to start with something that I grew up watching yeah. back in the day as a kid Bob growing Barker. up. I watched a show called The Price is Right. Most of our listeners are probably familiar with it. But but Nathan, you've got to tell us, you you lived a dream of mine and you got to actually be on the show. Tell us about this. Tell us it's about this experience. It's a true story. Yeah, my freshman year of school, I'm at the University of Arkansas. And uh, I everyone starts talking about in the spring <laughs> semester, like what they're going to do for spring break. And so I'm like, OK, I need a, I need something cool to do. Like, what am I going to do? And I overhear my RA say that she's going with some people to Los Angeles for spring break to go be on The Price is Right. And I was like, oh, I would love to go. And they were like, well, you know, we're, we've got a lot of people. It's already full. And I was like, well, my aunt actually lives. <laughs> my whole dad's side of the family lives in Southern California. We could probably That's stay funny. with them. And they're like, you should come. Like we need you to come. And so they heard uh, cheaper. That's what they heard. Yeah. We, my aunt still hasn't forgiven me for having 10 college guys sleep in her house. But, um, but anyway, we went and uh, the Tuesday of spring break, we got there at like 4 a.m. We waited in line forever. And uh, everyone gets like, I didn't know this, you know, they're trying to have good television. Everyone gets a little interview. Like, I yeah. heard that. Yeah. And so they just like, hey, where are you from? Right. What do you do? Like, they're just going down the line because they want to hear people. They want to see who's going to be good on television, you know? Yeah. And they get all the good people and they put their numbers in a hat and they start drawing them. And uh, so uh, we, they start filming the show. And I was the fourth person called down. Nathaniel Allen, you know, come on down. And so uh, went on stage. It sounds like I'm, you know, and when I got back to college, everyone was like, this guy was on The Price is Right. Like, it was a big deal. But then everyone watched the show. It's the most embarrassing oh, yeah. thing of my it's life. It's out there. Uh, it's we need to look this up. Story. <laughs> oh, you can find it on YouTube. But uh, so bad. I, I put all the wrong numbers. I mean, I'm a poor pastor's kid. I know how nothing works. Wait, didn't I've never spin bought the wheel in my life. It didn't go all the way so around? You're like, what are the prices? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's just the icing on the cake there. Like the one dollar was right there. And like the one thing I knew about the prices, right, is if you get the one dollar, you win a bunch of money and you automatically go to the end. I'm like, oh, easy. So I go right. to just like barely push this thing. I, I didn't know it weighed like four thousand pounds. Uh and so it barely even goes around and I, I just get booed the- like crazy <laughs> and it was awful. Uh but I went to the showcase uh and basically the other lady went over and so i automatically won the showcase on the price is right so in total for my games and everything i won a trip or two to rome a trip or two to for uh to hawaii uh a ford escape a jewelry box and a karaoke machine so uh it was it was the craziest thing ever uh in my whole life so uh Yeah. yeah it's one of the greatest kind of you know, two truths and a lie game, you know, like fun facts. And uh, honestly, I, I don't, I haven't, I've told so many people forever that I haven't really said it a whole bunch. Like, and then Drew Carey took over and all this stuff. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, Bob Barker passed away just like two weeks ago. And so I said, you know what, I'm just going to make a tribute. And I put uploaded the YouTube video to Facebook and just said, Bob Barker, you know, had a huge impact on life, super thankful and just posted it. And then uh, a friend of mine from high school was actually a local news producer of a TV station here. And he immediately messaged me on Facebook, hey, can we interview you about The Price is Right? And I'm like, okay. Oh my gosh. So we interviewed yeah. me for like two awesome. hours and they used like 
12 seconds of my talk uh and Nathan, you're so and much stuff. fun anyway, man it's just, i happen it's to know that in college you were so also it's a, it's a pretty um, fun the thing, mascot so. at the basketball games boss hog uh and if you're or, you know anywhere close to the university of arkansas and you you got to get to a basketball game and boss hog is like so much fun and nathan allen the guy sitting on the podcast right now was oh, yeah. that guy how Come many on. years did you do that Three years, you're the mascot. Um, I did but, it. Uh, you know, was, the for more, three years, I was the mascot. Uh, I get to know so, you, man. The so. more fun of just a mm -hmm. man you are, and the more layers there are to you. And you, Joseph already mentioned the beekeeping, and we could we could spend hours talking just about beekeeping. But I want to dive in a little bit sure. to, um, man, just your your ministry, which is a huge part of who you are. You're you're a learner. You're you're in seminary right now. You're a constant guy that's looking for opportunities yeah. to grow, but just give our audience um, and the listeners, you know, a little bit of insight in how did, how did that calling, how did the journey to ministry, full-time ministry, what we would call vocational ministry, how did that begin for you? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I, my family has been in ministry a long time. Uh, my his family history goes way back with people who've been involved in church planning and all sorts of stuff. But my grandfather was a pilot in World War II and fl uh, flew for World War II in Korea. This is your and father's then, dad? Uh, after Korea, he yeah. became a chaplain uh, in the Air Force, and then he became a pastor. Yes, correct. Yeah. And, uh, and then my dad uh, grew up in Air Force around the world, uh, felt the call to ministry. And so uh, he... Mm -hmm. I mean, he's one of the smartest guys ever. Obviously, I had a great dad, huge impact on my life. He had a he had a uh, a PhD and two masters, uh, so he was brilliant. Uh, he mm. had a PhD in uh, theology and a masters in ministry and a masters in psychology. So uh, he was brilliant, educated man, uh, great storyteller, great Bible preacher. Uh, and so, growing up a pastor's kid, it was a, it was a big part of my life. Like. Um, and we planted a church very early on in Fayetteville uh, after we moved here uh, when I was just like three years old. And so yep. uh, growing up in the church <laughs> with a small family and like a church plant, like it's all hands on deck. Yeah. So my whole life, yeah. it's like it was just built into my DNA mm -hmm. of like we're a big family and you just do what's got to be done. And so from a little kid, I'm setting up chairs Saturday night, Sunday morning. I'm running a soundboard at the age of 12 and 13 oh, yeah. uh in high school i'm you know playing in the band on sunday morning leading worship guitar uh just like you know serving in youth just mm. doing all sorts of stuff uh and so it was kind of just a part of my life that's what we did i didn't grow up playing sports the one thing we did do was was band and so uh i played trumpet you were in, in the college and, band. Uh, that's right i actually got a scholarship yeah. at the university of arkansas for the marching band and so that's Hmm. Yeah. Come on. And, yeah. And I loved it and loved music, but man, it killed me. Like you have band practice every day for like three hours on a game day weekend. You're spending 14 hours. Like you're just in, it was wonderful. And the scholarship was great, but it was so much. But then I found out mascots, like I, it's I can like do that. get there an hour ahead of time and go be an idiot. And it's like the same scholarship. And so I'm like, this is, come on. In my sophomore year of school, I found up now. <laughs> the sophomore year of school, I found out that my um, the uh, I heard that yeah. all the because in pregame yeah. before school starts, you run through the A and you do all the Arkansas pregame. Every school's got their pregame stuff, and so we're out there with all the cheerleaders and mascots and all the people practicing, and we find out that every one of the mascots are seniors, and I thought that means if I try out, I got the same shot as everyone else. Like, He's there. And so I, I tried out and that's, that's how I got the gig. And so anyway, and in, moving in into college, mm. my dad even said that he told me at one point when I was a kid, you're going to grow up to be a pastor. And I thought, no way, there's no way. Uh, I loved history. I loved teaching and I was going to school to be a history teacher, get a degree in history. And then I wanted to get a master's in teaching and, um, mm -hmm. you know, just being automatic in ministry it's just what you do i immediately and i i god has cursed me with the inability to say no sure. to anything yeah. and so um 
much to my wife's, um, you know, frustrations. And so it's, it's been a huge growing thing for me to say no, especially I have a family and little kids, like, you know, there's other things, there's other better things yeah. that I have to say you no to yes to Nathan's for, seven on for, the Enneagram. I'd say no to good things to say yes All to seven, greater things. And so yeah, he loved that, that was a long lesson. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love, I love everything. A very healthy seven, like, you know, a lot of sevens I've learned are coming from yeah. traumatic it's stuff. Them. And so yeah. they're running from emotional pain and they're seeking fun to avoid that. Mm -hmm. But, but that's not me. I, God just gave me a passion for mm -hmm. learning about everything. And so um, mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons I like wanting to be a teacher. Like, my number one strengths finder is woo, winning others over. I want to get people excited about the things. And so mm -hmm. when I started becoming involved in campus ministries, I was serving at a whole bunch. I was volunteering and I was learning through all these programs and leadership and Bible studies, like getting deeper into God's word and teaching others. And then um, I think it was the end of my freshman year, um, a guest speaker came to the my mm -hmm. campus ministry and uh, he worked for a ministry called The Traveling Team. I'd never mm -hmm. heard of him in my life. And he went, in about 30 minutes, went through the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And again, pause. Growing up a pastor's kid, <laughs> I knew everything about the Bible, I thought. You know, yeah. I was doing Bible trivia from the time I could walk. Like, I knew, I so thought I knew everything. the whole night, yeah. Yeah, super <laughs> prideful about things. And this guy... I'm sitting here listening mm. to him, hearing all these verses, and I'm like, who swapped out my Bible? I, mm. I'd never seen any of these things. And so that was my first kind of eye-opening experience to God wants to do more mm. in my life. And he has so many other plans that I just didn't know about. And, and that was kind of the first step of like, God is on this epic story to redeem the entire world. That's right. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a role in that. And it's different for That's everyone. Right. I think people automatically think, well, I got to pack up and move to some foreign country. That's not true. That's not the world we live in. And But everyone has a role. And so um, right. it wasn't so much that I'm going to I'm going to be a paid religious professional like that's going to be my career. It was just I'm yeah. going to pursue what God's doing because there's yeah. nothing there's no greater story I could be a part of. You know, yeah. price is right whatever mascot but to pursue what god's mm. doing and he wants to give me a role on his team i just i can't comprehend that like i'll do whatever you know uh and so that was kind of honestly to answer the question it honestly took a while for me to realize oh i i kind of am a professional minister like that that is the career i'm doing um and that was honestly my journey into seminary I've been in this role at New Heights Church for seven years now. It's the Global Missions Pastor. I've been on staff for almost 10 years. And it took about <laughs> it took about seven or eight years for me to realize, like, oh, this is like my career. Uh <laughs> I guess I should like make it official. And so I love learning. And so that's when I enrolled in seminary. I think people think you have to like know all the stuff about the Bible for God to use you or something. Before you start. Yeah. And I had it completely backwards. I'm like, I'm just going to jump in and wherever God is working, I'm just going to follow him. <laughs> and I'm just going to say yes to whatever's in front of me. Sometimes too many yeses. Uh, but then it, uh, over time, I just realized like, this is my job. This is what I'm doing. And that's why, like, I guess I should, I love learning. I'm mm -hmm. going to learn more about the Bible and theology so that I can yeah. eventually be used to greater levels and capacity. So that, that's kind of my story. That's really good, Nathan. And I I love how Josh highlighted both the Enneagram 7, but also even you saying just the, the heart to be able to jump in full force and continue to be able to learn and to grow. And um, that's obviously position you when it comes to ministry and calling. But if anyone's around you for any length of time, Nathan, they're going to hear you talk about the globe and they're going to hear you talk about missions. And you've even uh, mentioned it already in this conversation. So I would love to know, like, um, just how did that passion start for you? Or when did it really begin to unearth that, I man, global missions is something that I am passionate about. And I believe that everybody should be a part of it. That was uh, understanding God's heart and his plan for the world. Uh, 
God kind of had to hit me over the head pretty hard for me to get it. I, uh, when I was in high school, my youth pastor was this uh, graduate from John Brown University, and mm. I'd never seen someone sacrificially love, you know, all the weird kids in my youth group that I didn't want to talk to. He was just serving and loving everyone like Jesus. And it was so shocking to me. I'd never really seen anyone. I mean, I've been in ministry and been a, a church, a pastor's family, like, and we've done some loving things for people, but it was kind of like mind blowing how much. And the other thing that was so impactful, um, his name is Aaron Hager. And the only other thing that was super impactful was he was crazy about missions. And I thought it was the craziest thing I've ever heard of. I like to tell people I grew up in like this Fox News household and like uh, the world is in cahoots and it's crazy and America is the best. And like why in the back yeah. of our youth group, we had this map with all these letters and like the pins and the yarn and missionaries. Yeah. We our church had no missionaries. I don't know who any of those people were. Uh, and he's like, Nathan, you've got to read this letter from this missionary. It's the most wow. amazing story I've ever heard. Wow. And I told him, Aaron, I'm an American. I don't care about that stuff. Mm. And I was just absolutely clueless on God's global plan. And I think mm. one of the biggest problems is like I was taught to read the Bible like it was a yearbook. Yourself. Yeah. When you open yeah. a yearbook, yeah. like on yearbook day, high school, you know, what Find are you looking yourself. for? Where am I? Where am I in yeah. the story? And and I've taken John 3.16, and mm. I've been trained growing up to say, for God so loved Nathan that he sent his only son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish and have eternal yeah. life. And so, but what I did is I took the world out, and I put my name in place. Mm. And so... That's not wrong. God loves me, and that's one of the reasons he sent Jesus. Yeah. But I just forgot the world in the process. And mm. so all throughout God's world, the mm. thing that really changed my life is, uh, like I said, this campus minister in, in freshman year of school walked me through the Bible, and then he started discipling me and showing me about Saudi Arabians that were on my campus. I had no idea they were even there until he pointed them out to me. He's like, look at those guys. You can tell by their designer jeans, and you can smell their cologne from a mile away. Those mm. guys are from Saudi Arabia. And we, he said, they're the least Muslim they're ever going to be. They've never heard the gospel of Jesus their entire life. They're mm. at campus here mm. for four years, and then they're going to graduate and go home and never get an option to hear about Jesus ever again. And you mm. might be the only reason, the only way they get to hear about Jesus. And that day, I just stopped and prayed and said, God, I'm sorry. I just missed it. I had no idea that you wanted to reach everyone and that you wanted me to play a part in that. And so mm -hmm. um, helping see and understand, like, it all starts with God's word. When you dive in and you see that every book, every story, every plan, every miracle, God is doing something to reach people around the world. It changes everything. Missions is yeah. not my idea or some church's idea it's not because we like taking good trips it's because <laughs> god is it's because god has promised to reach people of every nation and every language and every tribe of the whole earth mm -hmm. when the new heavens and the new mm -hmm. earth come and there's going to be the this the greatest wedding party you have ever seen in your life when jesus comes to be with his bride the church it will be made up of people from every nation and every language and mm -hmm. Jesus does not want the party to start until everyone is accounted for. And so uh, Matthew 24, 14 says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a testimony to all nations, mm -hmm. and then the end will come. Yep. And so this is the plan, the, the, the motion the, that God is going out there somewhere and, and, that, um, that has man, that I could talk about basis for missions <laughs> talk. We will find that and link that in the show notes. So you guys can double click on what Nathan um, is discussing right now, because it, it's what he just described as, you know, sure. God's God's word, God's work, God's world. Um, and just going through that process is a worthy journey for anybody who's never really seen mm -hmm. the scriptures from that angle. And it really is like somebody just ch changed out my Bible. And I, I remember that as well, um, you know, and then. It just, it, you can't ever yeah. unsee once you've seen. So, and what a blessing to be able to see things as they really are, you know? So it's true. Um, 
Nathan, one of the yes. questions we'd love to ask you is you got a great pulse. I mean, you're not just the global pastor of what's happening here in Northwest Arkansas, but you're connected with, I don't know, 30 plus countries, missionaries, teams around the world, plus all these agencies. Um, what are you seeing in this season when it comes to uh, just mm -hmm. mission strategy, you know, specific stories, people, just what are you seeing, hearing, feeling, sensing um, when it comes to just the, the missions movement right now on the earth? Um, mm. I think it's easy to, with this yeah, like 24 hour news culture and Twitter and, uh, or X and all these other things that it's easy to mm. get depressed and worried and scared, like what's actually happening. But like two things are shockingly happening at the same time. Uh, Satan's attacks against the global church are stronger and faster uh, than ever before, mm -hmm. but the church is growing in leaps and bounds like ever before. And that's why I think you see that the church is growing in ways yeah. and places yeah. that it never has. And yep. so Satan is in Great panic picture. mode. Yep. You know, it's like Putin right now in Ukraine, throw everything at him. We don't know what to do. Um, there's so many things that are causing the global church to move. Uh, and, uh, one of those things, for instance, is technology has allowed worldwide uh, efforts in Bible translation and communication mm -hmm. uh, like like never before. Um, mm -hmm. For mm -hmm. instance, we all know COVID and lockdowns and how horrible and hard that was for us. It was traumatic. Um, there's a million churches. I think if a prophet of God told every church in America, he came and said, right. everyone needs right. to start recording their church services and putting it online. It everyone would say like, you're crazy. Yeah. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. But now every church maybe not every, but most every church is re is recording their services and putting them online. And even at New Heights Church in Fayetteville, we had people who walked in our doors. They would have never walked before during co before COVID. And because they're stuck at home, they start watching online and they're like, this is a church I can go to. And we had so many people join our church because mm -hmm. they said, we found you on the internet. And so um, not on, but you got to think about global worldwide internet. Yeah, our missionaries on yeah. the other side of the planet can watch our church services on Sunday morning and be encouraged and see and see what's going on at their home church. And so, like, that's just one little snippet about how the internet is changing world uh, global communication. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, um, we have a, a number of workers who are in a Middle Eastern country. It's a closed country. Um, they know the Arabic better than I think almost anyone I know. I mean, they've been studying for over a decade. They're brilliant. Uh, it takes a long time to get really proficient to communicate on a spiritual level in Arabic. It's really hard. But hmm. they've been super faithful, meeting with thousands of people a year. And even a fraction of the thousands were interested in spiritual things. And of that fraction, how many of you all want to talk about Jesus and maybe read the Bible together? Just a fraction of them. Like they couldn't meet enough people. It's just a numbers game. They couldn't meet enough people to find enough people. So they had this brilliant idea. They got connected with uh, global ad uh, marketing, internet marketing people in Northwest Arkansas who are specialists. That's what they do. Working for Walmart, working for vendors. All they do is specialize in advertisements online, Google AdWords, Instagram ads. And they just start putting stuff in Arabic in Middle Eastern countries saying like, have you had a dream about Jesus before? Do you want to talk about it? Have, here's they would put a quote from Jesus. Would you like to meet someone who have you ever talked to a Christian before? And mm -hmm. after developing this plan mm -hmm. and ad strategy and all these things, they yeah. now before they couldn't meet enough people at all. Now they have more people to disciple than they have time. Mm -hmm. Technology is changing the way we're reaching the world. And I think one of the biggest problems is uh, it's all right for the taking. It's all there, but there's two problems. One, you've got those ad professionals. You've got people That's in America really who are professionals yeah. in their career, and they don't know that God wants to use them in the kingdom. Yeah. And they think, Nathan, you're a pastor. You're a religious guy. I'm not. You do that. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't do that. That's not true. Yeah. God wants to use you. And, and the second thing is, missionaries on the other side who are religious professionals, mm -hmm. they're theology nerds. They don't know what technology or what innovation could be happening. 
Mm. And so we've really got to connect to finish the whole world. Uh, technology, AI has helped Bible translation to be a fraction of the time as it used to be. I mean, there's so many amazing things that are happening mm-hmm. around the globe. Um, but like I said, at the same time, there's more persecutions and more martyrdoms uh, and more governments oppressing and killing Christians than ever before. They can speak about um, just briefly and we'll move on. But like up. Uh, the, 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 the center of, of gravity fast. for for yeah. the church in the world has shifted over the past hundred years from a European Western centered church to now I think if you were to move that center of gravity that belly button if you will of Christianity it would be somewhere in Central Africa just north and Central Africa as a a center of gravity and. And there's this term, the the global south, yeah. and when people talk about that, they're talking about Latin America, Africa, and Asia, also known as Lafricasia, right? So just talk about that movement um, and what you're seeing um, coming from <laughs> just that whole global south focus. And it seems like the Holy Spirit's putting a highlight on the believers in those nations. Yeah, I, I mean, for sure. 1700s, 1800s, the average Christian in wow. the world was a white European male. Now, today, the average yeah. Christian is a sub-Saharan African woman. Uh, the the global South, I love what you said, the belly button. Uh, the church is really moving. Um, yeah. But there's two issues. I mean, that's a one, that's wonderful news, right? Um, but, but there's several issues that comes with that. One, um, the church in the West needs yeah. to realize that um, just because we're not having as much influence in our culture, that doesn't mean we're necessarily losing. I think we're coming out of uh, this honeymoon period mm-hmm. in the church in the West where we had anything we want and we're going to teach kids about the Bible yeah. in school. And like, in um, that's never yeah. been how Christianity has been. It's been like that for us, but yeah. in the world, I mean, from the oppression mm-hmm. to the Roman empire onwards, like, that's not the way it goes, but we still need to submit mm. to the government and do the right thing. So I think we need to rethink our role in society. That doesn't mean don't influence as much as you can, but mm-hmm. we need to understand that. I think, I think the second thing is, is uh, a lot of people hear about the church growing in these places. Right. And so the church in the West thinks we don't have a role uh, because, you know, they got it. They got the gospel. Um, there's, there, there's two problems mm-hmm. in that, how our role needs to change. One, um, you and I have more Bible apps and Bible software mm. and, and commentaries and yeah. theological books in English than we could ever we read in 10,000 years. I mean, yeah. we have more resources. We're so resource rich, we don't even know it. Whereas this growing yeah. infant church that is multiplying like crazy does not have established, developed leaders. They don't have 10,000 theology podcasts they can jump mm. in on. And so they need help. They need training. They need support. They need translation work. They need good, solid, biblically sound teaching and training. But on top of that, um, they can reach a lot of places in the world that we can't reach. That's right. Yeah. And so we need to not only train and equip them, but we also need to mobilize them. Uh, One of Mm -hmm. my, one of my missions hero, A.T. Pearson says every Christian Every Christian mm. needs a conversion to missions, just like a lost person to the gospel. I've heard that. Like it's this whole nother thing that happens when you realize it's a life-changing thing from being saved by faith and there's nothing I can do and Jesus did it all. Wow, it's amazing. When you realize that, it's just that great of, mm. a, of a moment in a Christian's life to say, God wants to reach the entire world and I have a role in that. Like, mm-hmm. uh, And so we need to mobilize the church. So just for instance, in fact, I have this. Crazy chart. You can't see any of the, all these numbers, but it's the top 100 countries with over a million evangelical believers in the world. So say for Ken- mm-hmm. Kenya or Mexico, these countries have millions of evangelical yeah. believers and they're sending comparatively almost no missionaries. So mm-hmm. America as sending Western missionaries, we're sending 0.01% of Christians in America to the nations. And we're one of the number one sending countries in the world. That's the standard is 0.01. If we were to get these countries to 0.01% and reaching their neighbors where they look the same and speak similar languages, we could send out millions and millions of missionaries. So their mobilization is not 
for instance, we have workers in Mexico City. There's over 15,000 mm -hmm. evangelical churches, not Catholic churches, just evangelical churches in Mexico City. Well, and yeah. less than 100 of them have ever sent any missionaries or done anything with missions. Ooh. So if That's... we can, we have a team there. Their whole purpose is to mobilize those churches in Mexico City to send and go into the world and reach other peoples. So mobilization, uh, biblical training. Uh, and another thing, too, I'd say lastly, like the role of the American church is uh, yeah, that's good. we're not the great white saviors of the world, right? Like that's it's right. not like we're going to go save everyone, but we do have a really important, valuable role. And I would argue there are places like very remote, hard tribal places where to go yeah. there and reach those people, you need a Western, educated, wealthy person who can – fly in with helicopters and have a solar panel hut and spend and pay money and mm -hmm. medical resources and fly in food for them to learn a tribal group's language for a long time in order to translate the Bible That's in that so language. Good. Like we still have a big role in reaching some of the hardest yeah. place reaches in the world. And I would say that we, we all, uh, there's a huge discrepancy, but, but um, yeah, the mission isn't done. And so there's a lot of work to That's do. Right. I think you, there's that was really rich with a lot of good stuff, a lot of good challenge for us there as well, and um, and you even described you know some real time things that are happening, and you know I love what you said is that the as 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 the globe continues to be able to to meet Jesus to let him become mm -hmm. the Lord, their Lord and Savior, there's leaders that need to be or that are trying to rise up and they need to be resourced, and for us within the multiply family, I mean that's a big heart and passion for us is to identify mm -hmm. leaders. And give them the resourcing that they need, so that way the great commandment, the great commission, can continue to be able to spread. And uh, Nathan, I, I think there's so so many deep waters there. I think we'll we'll probably need to even circle back for another conversation um, on that side of it. Um, but one thing that I would love to be able to know about is, you know, for an average listener, they're sitting, they're listening. You're like, yeah, I, that's yep. that's good. Like, I feel like we need to have a role within global missions, and we're talking about sending millions of people, but like that doesn't really connect to my everyday life and it feels very much like from afar. And so what would you say to those that are listening and how to be able to really integrate the great commission into their life? Like, I mean, they listen to you. They're great like, well, question. of course you're the pastor. You're, you're reading all the books. Like that's all you, but like, what does that look like for me as your average, average listener? Jesus gives the most important and entry level job in the entire mission. He mm -hmm. is talking to his disciples, and many of y'all know this verse. He says, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Yeah. And do you know what I expect Jesus to say? So get off your butt. There's stuff to do, right? Like, I expect him to say, so go learn another language. So go, uh, you know, memorize the entire Bible or pa get your shots and passports and move to another country. That's not what he says. He makes it so easy. He says, the harvest is great. The workers for few. So yep. pray earnestly, pray really hard for God to send out more workers. Hmm. Jesus, in all of the gospels that I have seen, he only at three times ever gives us three prayer requests. Okay. And this is one of them. Pray mm -hmm. to the Lord of the harvest. Pray that God would raise up workers. There's a bunch of Christians in our country who are consumed with the wrong things. God, would you change their heart and send out workers? God, there's so many churches that are spending their money, not on global things, but on things that really don't matter that much. God, would you change mm. their budgets and send out workers? Like he's, that's the easiest and most important thing. And I think we don't realize like, it, yeah. it's almost kind of like backwards to me. It's like, God, if you want to reach the world, just do it. So why does he ask us to pray? Because he wants us to care about it too. That's right. He wants us to think about it too. It's like when I started dating my wife, I mean, she is a health nut. She is a healthy eater. <laughs> and I remember looking at her shopping list. I'm oh, like, babe, funny. what's quinoa? She's like, that's quinoa. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's no good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't care at all right about this stuff but man now that we've been married uh seven eight years i like make sure that we're stocked with quinoa and we've got lentils in the fridge and i have gluten-free rice flour and stuff that she really cares about why because when i started i didn't care that much but as i've grown to love her i grow to love the thing that she loves 
I think mm. the most important thing any Christian can do is say, God, I don't care about the world. I don't understand this. This guy on this podcast is a weirdo. I have no idea why. But he says, you care about this a whole lot. So would mm -hmm. you, if you care about it, would you help me care about it? God, would mm -hmm. you raise up workers? And so I think that's the number one thing. I think the second most important thing is like the world is not as big and crazy as you think it is. Like my grandmother grew up in Coffeeville, Mississippi. Uh, I, I asked her, she passed away last year uh, in Thanksgiving. And I asked her, have you ever met a Muslim before? And she said, you know what, Nathan? I don't think I ever have. And she said, if you had to ask me what they believe, I would have no idea. I can't go into Walmart in Fayetteville, Arkansas today mm -hmm. and not see a woman in a hijab. Like the nations are all over. There are people mm -hmm. from so many countries who are all over the place. And Jesus didn't say, hey, go reach and make disciples of all the countries. Yeah. He said, make disciples of all the yeah. nations. That Greek word ethnos means peoples. People. So it's about peoples, not places. And so yep. every person can meet someone from another culture. And so uh, they're around you. We need to pray. And then we just need to be open. God, would you show me someone from another culture and help me be a friend to them? That's it. And that yeah. is so entry level. Any A child can do those things. Um, everyone needs to, to fulfill their role and their responsibility. I, I, I remember one pastor guy mm. said, the, the man who equips the church to pray will finish the Great Commission. Mm. We have no idea how powerful our prayers are. God hears them and he wants to answer them. And so when we say, mm. Lord, would you raise up laborers from Fayetteville, from Arkansas, from America to go to the nations? He you know, he wants to answer that prayer. And so, um, yeah, it's, you know, wearing khaki clothes and going to Ooga Booga land. That's not missions anymore. Um, Man, that's so it is good. for some people, but for um, most people, and, it's just how do you reach your neighbor This is going to end country? up sounding a lot like a pitch because this is such a perfect lead in to what you've been hosting for the past, is it six years now that you have um, put on the Northwest Arkansas for the Nations Conference. And and honestly, mm -hmm. that term sounds limiting, like it's just people here. It's actually mission agencies from all over the U.S., uh, missionaries from all over the world. Last year, we had one of our global partners from India that flew in mm -hmm. for this conference. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a huge deal. Um, and you've been so faithful to grow this thing systematically to become one of the premier mobilization conferences in America. And uh, man, I congratulate you on um, all that you've done to make it so, um, mm -hmm. so effective and powerful and useful and practical. Um, and, and one of the things that I love about the NWA for the Nations Conference is now you got a ministry track, people that are really considering, hey, I want to learn God's heart. Am I going, am I supposed to go to the nations? But then you've also got this marketplace track. Hey, how can God use me in the marketplace, um, kind of like those friends uh, that partner with so the um, people in the Middle East. Tell us a little bit more about NWA for the Nations. Um, the theme this year, um, invite our listeners to participate and um, and just tell us how to, how to access um, tickets and that such. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. It's it's been really great to see God bless it. Um, I so I look at this conference like the little boy's lunch yeah. that gave Jesus. Like I've got some bread, and God just took it and did some awesome stuff. Like really, I it, it's really simple. Um, one, there was a lot of young people, college right. students, young adults who want to do something in missions, but didn't know what they didn't know. Like, yeah. where do I go? Who do I work with? And we're like, well, let's just take care of that. Let's bring in a bunch of organizations who we trust and you can meet them and start the conversation. You're not signing up for anything. Just start yeah. the combo. Just meet them. If you do want to go overseas, what do you need to know? How can you start now so that you will be successful in the future? The second thing is we had there's so a lot true. of churches in our area. Yeah. I mean, God has done something crazy in North of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Like there's something in the mm -hmm. water. He has blessed this area in so many ways. But specifically, there's a lot of people in churches that have a passion to reach the world. But only when I got in this job did I realize, like, almost no one is working together. Hmm. Like, do we really believe there's one king, one church, one baptism, one Jesus, one Lord? Then why are we so tribal and, like, not working together? Now, yeah. man, I'm all about good theology and good mission strategy. And if you've got convictions, 
awesome. There are so many churches and ministries that don't. And so mm-hmm. we need to help each other. Uh, yeah, We need to be able to help and equip. Churches need to help talk about how do you care for missionaries? What have you done better? How can we help mm-hmm. our church? Uh, and how can we help train up people and send them well? Because it's the church's role. It's not a mission agency's role. Uh, it's our church's role to train up people well. So how can we help do that? Uh, and then as the conference has grown and had more influence, like we want to make it as practical yeah, and as simple as possible. Genius. Step one, <laughs> do it when there's an away game for the Razorbacks. Okay, that makes it easy. Step two, uh, there's <laughs> when we started thinking about this, there are great conferences around the world about missions. There are great speakers. Like they're expensive and they're far away. So we made ours cheap and in town and close. And uh, we wanted to make it as easy as possible. It starts on a Friday night uh, and then it goes most of the day on Saturday. You're done yeah. between five and six on Saturday. So the people you've met at the conference, go grab dinner together. Like it, we build all these things in the conference just to keep it going. We're not going to rewrite your church's mission strategy and we're not going to give you a, a, you know, a roadmap for your life. God doesn't work in roadmaps. Uh, I feel like he says your word is a lamp to my feet. Right. It's not a yep. GPS to the end zone. Yep. Like that's that's not what he does. So we just want to help start the conversation. There's so many people in Northwest Arkansas who are doing like, for instance, great ministry uh, with Bentonville Rogers with people from South mm-hmm. in, Asia and in, in the Indian community. Are they working together? What can they learn from each other? Are, are they targeting different groups or the same groups? Like we just want to get the ball rolling to, to reference back to like the Enneagram yeah. seven. It feels I just like want to throw the biggest missions party ever Dude, and I on. want everyone to come. And literally the, the whole, the whole agenda is for Jesus to receive the worship he wants. That's it. And so there's, we, it's cheap. You've got buttered biscuit, Onyx coffee, well, Chick Fil A. That's, that's if the you went and got all those right on there. Saturday that's at your own, it would cost day. more than the conference itself. So Come on. <laughs> uh, we, there it is. we have we have childcare. Uh, you can pay one price, and we'll and it's not. Let me be clear. It's not. We're not gonna like just put on a movie for your kids. That's this so is great. like a missions VBS. They might want to learn more at the conference than you will. Uh, and yeah. uh, it, it's incredible. And so we're doing the best we can to help mm-hmm. mobilize and equip. And our, our words are like, unite, connect, and equip. We want to help you. Yeah. Everyone's got a different role. You're not supposed to do stuff for God's kingdom that I'm going to do and vice versa. So how that's can right. we help you get connected and find your role? That's it. Uh, that's good. We'll, what we'll do is we'll make sure to put all the yes. details in the show notes that way anybody listening can sign up. Well, and be I just there. was a mention the date. It's November 3rd and 4th, just so really everybody can about. hear Josh, you when that thing Friday and Saturday it. is. There, It's an away game. Um, it's an easy weekend. You've got time. Um, so we're really looking forward to being a part of that uh, personally. And yeah. I'll- I'll do one better for you guys. Uh, for the listeners of your podcast, yes. if you sign yeah. up, use the uh, coupon called multiply with an I, like it's spelled, we'll give you $5 off your entry. So Come on. Um, use that tonight just for your for your uh, people listening to the podcast. We want you to come. Uh, and, and just to be clear, like you said, there's people from mm-hmm. since year one from Oklahoma City, Kansas City, St. Louis, Dallas, like – who are coming to be a part of this thing. So, yeah. um, you know, we want you here if we can help you. So let us know. And just one more thing, if I can say, uh, I'm in discussions right now. The reason we kept the name NWA mm-hmm. is because we wanted this to be by churches for people in churches in Northwest Arkansas. Yeah. And it, we kind of had this love-hate relationship since the beginning because it's grown bigger than we could have thought. Yeah. Um, but the reason we kept it wow. is because wow. right now we're in conversations of, at KC for the nations, Kansas City for the nations for next year, launching Come the on. first one, a DFW for the nations, for churches and ministries to work together. Um, we will give you everything we've got. Here's our playbook. Go, go do it. We want to help you however we can. Uh, and we want to, we want the church to find your role. So that's really that's good. It. Well, Nathan, I, I, I definitely see another conversation happening within this uh, podcast. I think there's so much for us to be able to continue to be able to learn and grow from each other. I'll just leave our listeners with just two things that were said throughout the podcast. 
One, yeah. whether you're working for an ad agency or whatever that may be, you have a role to play when it comes to the Great Commission. Um, and there is a space for you and we need each other within that. And then one other piece that was said, it was a church that learns to be able to pray um, mm. will fulfill the Great Commission. And so uh, may we all, actually even right now, yeah. Lord Jesus, I pray that you can continue to be able to send workers to the harvest to fulfill the Great Commission and that you can use th those that are listening right now everywhere that this is being broadcast uh, to be able to rise up and see other workers and to pray for other workers to be able to come to your mission field to fulfill your heart because that's ultimately what we want to do. So, um, <laughs> hey, listeners, we thank you so much again for listening. We'll hear or we'll see you and hear you, I guess, or you'll Thanks hear again. us in yep. another couple of weeks, whatever that may be. But, hey, we love you all and we'll talk to you guys again soon. God bless. Thanks so much, guys.